I will work day in and day out to wake up and smell the coffee. The independence case is a powerful one. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will, and in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Tom Clark, a fellow of the Joseph Rand Foundation, a visiting fellow at Nuffield College, Oxford, a contributing editor at Prospect, and the editor of Broke, Fixing Britain's Poverty Crisis. Welcome to the podcast, Tom. Great to be here. Thanks, Will. It's great to have you on, Tom. And the first question that I'd like to ask is, what prompted you to um, put this book together? And uh, what was the process behind choosing the uh, writers who would feature uh, in this collection? It's a good question. I mean, um, you know, what we what we loosely call... Um, the poverty industry, I think often, um, uh, and, and I'm guilty of this very much myself sometimes, you know, we get very excited when the household below average incomes data comes out and we see people moving um, up or down relative to the 60% of median income after housing cost poverty line. And quite quickly, you're in a world where, um, as um, Stalin, to quote an unsavory person, is supposed to have said, Whereas, you know, the death of a million, sorry, one person might be a tragedy, the death of a million people. Well, that's a statistic. Um, and um, so once on arriving at Roundtree, kind of out of being the full-time editor at Prospect um, up till the autumn of 2021, I was thinking with my colleague, Graham Cook, about how we could get Roundtree to kind of try and bring poverty to life with a bit more of this kind of direct reportage and the moment it was almost exactly a year ago when it really hit me that this well, how necessary this task was was um you know we kept seeing these awful statistics come out malnutrition in hospitals people who were in hospital maybe for something else twice as many of them are suffering from malnutrition as, as, as a decade ago and rough sleeping we just saw the other day it's up by a quarter in a single year etc cetera, etc cetera. but none of these numbers particularly when you have boris johnson in number 10 he could just brush them off and then we had this um, single elderly woman, Elsie, 77 years old, a widow, ring up Good Morning Britain on the morning that Boris Johnson was on and sort of ask for any advice. Because as she said to the presenter, who then put it to the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson then was, you know, like she had nothing left, no money left for anything. She couldn't um, keep warm at home. So she'd go and get on the bus and stay on the bus all day. Boris Johnson was uh, normally so good at, like, you know, overturning a kind of cartload of statistics, suddenly really stumped. He's kind of, well, 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 you know, it's only thanks to the uh, Freedom Pass that I introduced that Elsie's able to stay on the bus all day. And, and suddenly you sort of felt that um, uh, complacency wasn't possible where you'd got this personal testimony. So that was, that was the backstory to why we thought reported stories of individual human cases was the right way to go and then in terms of the people we chose i think most uh of the people um we chose were people i knew because i'd worked with before mm -hmm. normally a prospect sometimes elsewhere on doing long form stuff that just took individual people's stories seriously now there were very different types of writers and i hope that's a, a strength of the collection so we've got people who are very lyrical writers like Cal Flynn, who writes very beautifully in a very kind of literary way. And then we've got really experienced, really kind of um, gritty uh, reporters like Jennifer Williams, um, who uh, writes about decks in the in the book and mm. with a real emphasis on getting to the facts. And so we kind of um, saw like, you know, given we've got to do this quite quickly, we need to have a team of people. We need people we know can write and we need people um, uh, to give it some flavour and some kind of variety are going to write different ways but above all people who have shown had shown me in the past that they would go and follow individual stories um, uh, and, 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 and find out about real people's um, lives mm -hmm. Absolutely and, and those individual stories are really core to how um, the, the book is, is, is so um, powerful to what extent do you think that the individual stories are able to to capture um, the scale of, of of inequality and and poverty and, and the sense that a lot of the uh, system in Britain 
is broken in a way that's easier for a, a reader to understand than a simple presentation of a, a statistic. You, you use the, the the famous Starling quote there. Um, do, do you think that that is really something that uh, is able to to hit readers more sometimes, being able to follow particular individuals' uh, stories through uh, the essays rather than just simply seeing the, the, the stark statistics? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right. I mean, I, I mentioned about Boris Johnson, but we could go further back. You know, we could talk about when we think about the Great Depression in the United States, for example, mm. uh, very quickly, the discussion turns to, you know, the grapes of rock rather than, and that's a fictional story, but a human story. Um, era in, in Britain, people would think of um, uh, uh, George Orwell or, J.B. Priestley's kind of reported stories of, of of individual people rather than the um, statistics at the unemployment and labour exchanges that would would have would have made the same point in a in a numbers rather than a stories type way. So when we look at these stories, I mean, you know, it, this is real reportage. So, like for example, we have Samira Shackle going to Tottenham. Food bank, and we she talks very interestingly about the types of people who come in. You see people coming in that wouldn't have been at a food bank, you know, in the recent past, because, for example, they're wearing a workers' overall. So there's little kind of details of observation that you don't see in statistics. But above all, like she talks about someone called um, Ida Bond, for example, who um, uh, used to be an extremely energetic woman, brought up mm -hmm. her family. And her mum one job, uh, it couldn't quite believe that she found herself needing to go to the food bank. And Samira sought her out and talked to her. And she said, "You know, the first time I tried to come along to this um, food hub, uh, I was in the queue, which was a very long queue, and I turned away because mm. I just thought this isn't isn't for me." But a week later, she was so hungry she had to go there, and that's the kind of thing that that I think lodges lodges in the mind. And then Samira's come to ask her about, you know, how food used to be a source of pleasure for her. And he, she used to cook these big plates of kind of West Indian food. And now she can't. And Samira also got from her um, the way that she um, doesn't tell uh, four children, four adult children, that she's going to the food bank and the food hub because she doesn't want to worry them. And again, that's something that you wouldn't see, even if you looked at the numbers on food bank um, use, the way, the, the way that obviously kind of ends up cutting people apart from the very people who should be there to support them. So there's a kind of texture, isn't there? And that's just one story. There's there's other stories I'll, I'll, I'll talk to, I'm sure, as we, as, as we go on. But um, I'm just thinking of that because it's right in the front of the book. And hunger is something we've all experienced. Hunger, you know, hopefully not because of lack of money but we will know what it is to feel hungry but when it what it feels like to feel hungry because you just can't afford to eat mm. um i think listening to favon and her, her testimony really makes that much more real absolutely and, and and one of the um the issues that that each of the essays highlights is that it isn't just um legislative change that is needed but there's also cultural change that that's needed in the way that we um deal with poverty and an example being that um uh, how renters are sometimes perceived and treated by by landlords um and, and letting agents and, and similarly people um using food banks how how often sometimes they feel a certain degree of uh, dehumanization um by the, the way um food bank statistics are sometimes discussed by some politicians and and, and some media outlets how do you think that this necessary change in attitudes can be achieved alongside changes to the law i i mean it's absolutely right what you say first of all you know stigma and the kind of mental kind of load of, of, of living with, with with poverty is just a huge huge part of it um and and people feeling ostracized feeling cut off um secondly like Let's be honest. This is going to be really, really hard to change because, um, like these sort of stigma against you know beggars or whatever, like you know, go very, very deep into the culture. You know, right back through the Victorian kind of idea of the deserving poor and the um, 
undeserving poor who need to up the the workhouse. You know, so these things kind of the way people talk about oh that's an est- dreadful estate. It's like a kind of sewer, and you know, you get these awful ways of talking that people would have picked up from their parents, who would have picked it up from their grandparents, who would have picked it up from their own parents. You might remember the workhouse. So um, these things go very deep, um, and uh, I think they can be changed um you know we've seen equally deep prejudices against you know homosexuality to take one recent example which have uh, have, have gone away over a generation and um uh, there's a lot of work to do obviously on the media um which is very hard to do but the one thing that politicians can do um is is watch what they say themselves because they have a the power to frame the debate and um, uh, I cite a study by John Curtis, um, which he did um, back in the sort of uh, last days of the, of, of the new Labour government, mm. where he looks at British social attitudes data from, I think it started that survey in 1983 or 1984, mm. and he saw a great swerve, you know, to what we would call the right or the kind of individualistic, non-empathetic account poverty that took place around 1994-1995 because um, that was when, um, you know, as he wrote all before him, Tony Blair was talking very much about how, um, you know, although, you know, we needed to do things about child poverty, we also needed to make sure there was no fifth option. There was no uh, people swinging the lead or lying in, li- lying in bed. And Labour basically stopped defending uh, benefits as it had done up until then. And um, uh, and then John Curtis pinpoints this because he says it's not a general move in public opinion. It was a move amongst Labour supporters, suggesting that, you know, that, 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 that there was a, a, a move that was led from the top of the Labour Party, um, essentially towards a more kind of sceptical... Um, kind of deserving versus undeserving or kind of um, line uh, around that time. Now, of course, Labour went on to do lots of fantastic things on the um, uh, headline rates of benefits for families with children and for um, uh, various other um, groups, particularly pensioners. Um, But uh, that kind of deserving and undeserving kind of line remained there right through the period. And indeed... um, into the change of government in 2010 when the mood changed and the money changed and they were suddenly cutting in, instead. And so um, then when the time came for cuts, because there was no one really fulsomely defending Social Security and the idea that no one should fall too far behind, a lot of those cuts were made very easily with programmes like Benefit Street and uh, one called on Channel 5, Gypsies on Benefits and Proud, but they or not, that was that was, mm-hmm. that was a programme. Um, and uh, this created a very poisonous atmosphere uh, in which benefits could be cut very um, easily by um, George Osborne. And you know, we we talk in the stories in 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 the book about there's there's one couple. Maybe we'll come on to talk about them more that we call Mike and Sandra. Who you know during that kind of deserving versus undeserving kind of mm. um, argument of the cuts actually found themselves hounded, you know, as, as a couple where both of them were on benefits because there'd been something about it in the local paper. And it, it means that they were still talking to our reporters now on condition of anonymity. On a more hopeful note, once Labour started really um, getting stuck in and opposing benefit cuts um, pretty staunchly, um, uh, which was under Jeremy Corbyn, you know, for all his uh, problems, he, the Corbyn McDonnell Labour Party stood firm on that. Mm. Then they started to see that the coalition beat a retreat on working tax credits, on various cuts to the disability benefit. Um, and um, at the moment, um, Labour's running a mile from Jeremy Corbyn on most things, but I think it's staying relatively close to him. Uh, on uh, opposing most of these um, uh, benefit cuts. As far as I can tell, they're not promising to reverse it, but they're not kind of implying that there needs to be any more tightening. Or at least they won't. I just saw a story this morning 
as it happens well, whether we're talking about uh, if they crack down on fraud, which we know is really quite small, um, they might be able to pay um, a cost of living payment to people. So I hope that that's something they're not about to retreat on, but I'm, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt in the book because I haven't seen them retreat on it yet. Um, in the in, in the foreword uh, to the book, Kerry Hudson speaks very movingly about the impact of continual movement that had um, it had on her family and on her as a child um, in particular. And given that, as the Joseph Rowntree Foundation stated at the start of this year, there are around 3.9 million children in poverty in the UK, what do you think can be done to ensure that children are not only lifted out of poverty en masse, but there is also, uh, and going back to this cultural point, more effort put in to stop the stigmatisation that many children um, who, who are in poverty feel to, towards um, you know the, the attitudes that some of their fellow uh, classmates have towards them. Well, I mean, you know, like there there are things you can do through the education system uh, and through other parts of civil society, like sports club. You know, we have had um, stamp it out about you know racism in. in football grounds there could be a zero tolerance approach to poverty bullying in schools um and i think that would be a, a good thing if you can do it for racism why can't you do it also for that um uh it's interesting in kerry hubton's as you say moving forward she talks about um you know the stigma of getting the tokens that allows you to have the free school meal mm. uh and um you know, I, I I can really um, understand that because the, you know, the, the, there might be five or ten kids in the school of uh, class of thirty who are getting their dinner on this different basis, and everyone knows they're the free school meals kids. So, um, like stamping it down on bullying is is something that feels like a no brainer. But then you get into the the kind of policy where it gets a bit more difficult because in a poverty emergency, what's the priority? Is it to say? Free school meals for everyone. Maybe that would be a nice way to solve the problem because then, um, uh, you know, uh, no one would stand out by getting the free school meals. But it might also be that you think benefits are so low now that the top priority has to be increasing the rate so that people, um, when they go home, aren't returning to sort of squalor and want. Um, uh, and, um, like, you know, the, the, the priority has to be to do that rather than spend the extra money on um, free school meals for kids who don't need them. And I, I don't think any more than with, you know, you're not going to find the right balance to strike there when it comes to those um, kind of spending issues out of reportage much more easily than you're going to find it out of um, statistics. I think mm -hmm. we just need to like accept that it's um, a, um, a tricky balance, you know, how far to target help against how far to make it universal and there's there's a good case for some of both um but we need to take account of what people say and so if for example you have um an arrangement w which is making the children feel like carry with the you know the hiding the token for the reason mm. meal up a sleeve um you know maybe if you can't afford to do that all at once for everyone and you need money on increasing mm -hmm. benefits instead yeah. maybe you could just run the system in a different way so that like you know at the start of the term um uh, uh, a child is registered one way or the other and the parents who can afford to pay pay up front for the whole term and so it's not obvious day to day so i mean like what i'm saying there basing the idea of a kind of zero tolerance towards bullying um and also um, not demeaning people through the way you administer things is is basically what we should definitely do is be thoughtful and then we should, um, in the way we run things, and then secondly, we should um, take the experience, uh, the unpleasant experience of being on the wrong side of uh, one of those welfare systems and um, take that into account along with everything else we've got to weigh up in working out how far to do things universally and how far to target help where it's most needed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And of course, um, the, the link between um, deprivation and um, d disease with, with poverty is explored in um, uh, Danny Garevoli's uh, essay, um, particularly highlighting the issues in Glasgow. 
and it, it, it's, it's very stark reading because it shows how the scale of poverty can have an impact on people's uh, physical and mental health, which in turn, of course, has an impact um, on the health service uh, as well, because people, you know, ha having those um, physical and, and mental health issues as a, as a result of poverty uh, and, and deprivation can, can often need to um, health care support from the NHS. Do you think in areas in which poverty is at its very worst, it's a case not only of the government investing money in those areas, but also urgently well working on uh, building and repairing the infrastructure, um, such as hospitals, roads, train services, etc., in those areas, um, because often the, the the lack of infrastructure hinders any ability to break poverty uh, in those particular areas, and that by investing not only in in um, social services and, and, and in other programs but also investing in infrastructure you can really break poverty in in, in those areas i mean what, we, what what my take on this really is that like you know poverty if you like is an incredibly complex phenomenon mm -hmm. but it's a uh at the same time it's a simple problem and what, what i mean by that is that you know every type of poverty you can come up with as a habit of morphing into another form uh, of poverty. So, you know, like in Danny Garavelli's chapter, as you mentioned, we've got all these people who have terrible economic problems and, and, and no prospects in these, these bits of Glasgow, and that might lead them to depression and it might lead them to drink or to drugs. It might uh, uh, just, like, you know, put them in a despondent mood where they're immune system goes on holiday which mm. and if you get very down and um none of, none of this is news you know we know we know that like in the in the 1980s when you like not by any means across the whole country but in places like glasgow itself and liverpool and other big industrial centers that suddenly became post-industrial centers people kind of lost their identity and as a result they kind of felt terrible and they sometimes numb the pain with heroin and all the all the problems that that, that went with um uh that went with that so um there's certainly lots of interlocking um elements to this you know in francis ryan's chapter we've got um ill health turning into uh, a lack of money and in danny garabelli's we've got a lack of money turning into ill health so it's all kind of complicated cycles and and uh, 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 all the rest of it um, and in Glasgow in particular, Danny's chapter highlights some decisions that were made decades ago, mm. maybe with good intentions about the way to organise social housing uh, in in Glasgow, which, you know, the, the, there was a policy at the time which was like, let's create these buzzing new new towns around the edge of Glasgow and move all the skilled workers out there and that would be a great thing. But then it left a kind of a residualization effect so and, and, and a lack of hope and aspiration effect on the people left in the in the middle of Glasgow and so you know it did even worse than other post-industrial centers so yes things like housing and you know the broader economy um and then you know the the, the infrastructure you allude to you know trains and buses and very practical things that allow people to get out and, and improve their lot are clearly really um important but um you know at the same time there's just um at the moment it feels to me like there's just a kind of real emergency that needs emergency relief you know with the fuel prices and, and everything else because all of these complicated problems that we talk about um you know they're not necessarily things like addiction aren't going to be completely solved because you give someone a bit more universal credit but all the problems we cut we come up against all of them would at least be somewhat soon and some of them would disappear uh, if people had a little bit more um, money in their pockets. So, I mean, I, I, I'm at a point where I'm saying, you know, start to think about raising Social Security so that people get the mental bandwidth where they can start to think about using the better trains, using the better buses that might also need to, need to go in there. And what's most chilling of all, as your listeners will have picked up in the last couple of months uh, from various stories that have been on the news, and why it's so urgent to go and visit Glasgow, where life expectancy has been dreadful for ages, is that, you know, we've had a number of years now where life expectancy in England 
um, and well, and, and Scotland, but let's say in England to separate it from the Glasgow case study has stalled. We've got poorer communities where first women and then men and women were starting to see their life expectancy go down before the pandemic. And then, of course, it goes down even more during the pandemic. Mm. And, you know, there is at least a possibility that we might be looking at an American type situation um, where life expectancy on average actually starts to go uh, down, which, you know, is the kind of thing that should only happen in wartime. Mm. Like, you know, um, uh, and um, America, a country where poverty is worse than it is in England, um, however bad things would be, they could be, they could be worse. Um, uh, you know, shows why you know really need to care about poverty as such. Mm. You need to care about people dying. Yeah. Um, and if you do, you get you need you need to care about the poverty as well. Absolutely. And and you mentioned um, Frances Ryan's uh, essay there, and, and and in her essay she highlights how the system that we we have in place at the moment could be more of a hindrance than a help for those in need. As she says in the essay, benefit bureaucracy can be impenetrable if you're healthy, but when you're real, it's all the harder. Um, to what extent do you think that those who are in, in charge of the um, systems, in charge of the benefit system, are aware of these difficulties that many people face in accessing them? And how much do you think it would help tackling poverty if the systems were made more accessible than they currently are? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there is and there always has been a difference in, you know, uh, the way the benefit system interacts with people and the way the tax system interacts with people. Um, uh, you know, because one is more aimed at better off people who are, you know, giving the government money and the other one's yeah. people claiming money off the, of the government. So the government has a, a different attitude um, to it. And at one level, that's understandable. But at another level, as the number of people... Um, you know, working age people now uh, who are in poverty more likely to be in working households than not working households. They might well be working as, let's say, care workers. The fact that they need a top up to, um, uh, like, pay the pay their bills from the, from the government doesn't mean they're putting less into society than a kind of um, uh, hedge fund manager or something. And I think most people would think quite the reverse. So, um. Given that society doesn't necessarily see the kind of people who these days need top ups as undeserving, and it shouldn't see them as undeserving, um, I think it's time for the, the people um, running the benefit system to be pleased, as as we will be the tax system, where um, you know it can be frustrating, but by and large, if you stick around on the phone, they'll explain to you what's expected to you. If you're expected to do, if you're honest. Um, Whereas with the, with the benefit system, um, you know, it, it, it is baffling. We get cases um, uh, in, it, where where simply different computers within the Department for Work and Pensions don't talk to each other. And people end up building up these huge debts. Mm. Uh, and then they get told, sorry, you owe £1,800, you know, because let's say your child benefit stopped. You thought that would automatically mean, like Becker in Glasgow thought, um that your um, uh, other benefits will be adjusted in line with, um, uh, you know, because you, you, they, they've got the accurate record of the child's birth. They cease to be a child. You stop getting your child benefit and you might think you're all sorted. But it turns out you need to tell a different part of the DWP separately about that. And um, as a result, um, you build up this debt and they tell you about it after a year and they at least at the first letter, they say, we, we want you to pay this back, at, you know, like tens of pounds every week when you've got no money whatsoever. And so it's a huge cause of stress, you know, really huge cause of stress for people. And sometimes if you ring around and stick around, they'll, they'll, they'll agree to let you pay it back more um, gradually. Sometimes they won't. And it's not just about the complexity and the length of the forms and all of those things. It's also about the attitude, you know, like where we saw with the Chancellor in March saying, you know, we're going to impose sanctions a bit more rigorously for some groups. I mean, that means that people in job centres will be hearing, people running job centres, that it's part of their job to dock people's benefits quite sharply for being late for an appointment, 
Uh, and, you know, if you read these stories in this book, you just see that people are juggling all kinds of care and responsibilities mm -hmm. and whatnot. And it might be that there's all kinds of good reasons why um, you're late for an appointment or whatever, or you just forget what's going on that day. And um, it, it needs to be run with a certain mercy, with a lot of warning, and uh, with, you know, a, a fair number of fair chances. I think most people would accept that, and it's not at the moment. I, I mean, I, I, I totally um, agree. And, and one of the things that I think a lot of people um, face, and, and we've touched uh, upon it earlier, in the in the podcast is a sense of feeling of um discrimination and and, and a feeling that um that they're not being helped of be because of um uh, uh, something related to them personally and, and and daniel trilling's essay um which deals with the the broken asylum system and, and, and the immigration system certainly highlights a lot of the issues that people who uh feel like they've they've fallen through uh, the cracks when you know um, coming to Britain and haven't been given the support of uh, the that the they need from the state. To what degree do you think that a lot of issues that people um, face who 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 are in need, who have come via um, um, immigration or who who are seeking asylum in Britain face, is related to certain prejudices um, that are an unfortunate part of society and mean that they're not helped perhaps in the you know in the way that they should be and that more needs to be done to ensure that the system isn't so politicized and that more focus is placed on helping the individuals who are most in need rather than using them as a as a, as a political um, ball as is, is sometimes used by by some politicians. I mean, it's always the case that um, you know migration is a is a is a fraught political issue under under both parties and over many decades since you know mass travel became an issue. It's always been prone to being exploited. Um, uh, but I think that the kind of accretion of restrictions, what's known as NPRF or no recourse to public funds. Uh, which means there's an attachment to your visa when you arrive in the UK that says that, like, you're not allowed uh, to use welfare services if you if you need them in terms of housing or benefits or whatever. Um, uh, and, and and you know you can see how that's going to like play well in metabolism. You can also see that even without anyone being manipulated, a lot of voters in the UK will think, well, you know, we've paid in for this. And, People shouldn't be able to come from other countries and, and use these services. Um, but it is now like the slow accretion of these kind of restrictions. These are people who are not only do we not allow to take no benefits, mm. we frequently bar from working as well. So we, we, we kind of deliberately destitute them because we say you're not allowed proper benefits. You might or might not be entitled to some kind of very, very minimal uh, benefits that are much less than even the very low rates everyone else gets and, and we're not going to let you work so you're in a bind um, and um, uh, so now when we look at not just people below the statistical poverty lines but the people who are turning up at homelessness centres at kind of soup kitchens and all the rest of it there's a um, Harriet Watt University funded by JRF does a kind of um, tally based on that kind of approach and it's found, you know, rising overall destitution and particularly within that rapid rise in the no recourse to public fund migrant group. Um, so it is when people see people sleeping on the street or sleeping in tents. There's a chap who's fallen between the gaps in the post-Brexit um, uh, uh, rules. In Daniel Trilling's chapter, he's ended up sleeping in a tent near... Thetford because, you know, he's not quite got the right to work anymore, even though he would do if he got the paperwork in in, in, in time. Um, uh, but when we see this kind of really acute poverty, it often is to do with these restrictions that, um, that we've cumulatively, in a crowd-pleasing way, aimed at uh, immigrants over the years. And uh, although I say, you know, that like a lot of voters might feel like, well, you know, the welfare state should be there for the families and the people who paid into it. I don't think 
that people really want, really understand the logic of what they're um, voting for is with all these crackdowns on the rights of migrants. So, you know, if we take this woman, my uh, Mary, who is someone who everyone would think of as a deserving person. She ran away from Zimbabwe. We know about the horrors there because of the political violence. She feared being killed. She ran away in a terrible hurry because, of course, that's what you do if you're um, threatened with kind of uh, uh, political thugs like driving you out of your home. So she didn't have all the right paperwork on arrival. Um, she has been in the UK for 20 years. She's not a drug addict. She's someone who goes to church, but she's got no income and no right to work. Um, and so, um, you know, what does this mean? What this means is that this woman who we've had as living amongst us in the UK for 20 years, when she wants to go to sleep, has to go and sit in St. James's Hospital foyer because that's a warm place that you can go at night until someone kicks her out. Or she has to go down the street to where the mega bus goes to London and then drives back to Leeds, you know, the cut price bus you'll have seen on the M1 that... Mm says one pound return ticket and someone will have discarded and will give her a ticket and she can get on the mega bus and sit on it go down to victoria coach station then come back to leeds and that gets you eight hours of sleep but that's the only way she can sleep if she doesn't want to sleep on a park bench and um like i say i mean she's not she's not done anything that anyone would really think of as undeserving she's not fallen into drugs or whatever she's just run away from political violence and that's where she finds herself and i mean Really, this is one of those things where we need politicians. It won't be easy at the moment when you look at the kind of nasty tactics they're using on both sides of the commons at the moment. But um, to sort of make an appeal to people and say, you know, we like to think of ourselves as a civilised country. If we've got a 50-year-old woman who's been here for 20 years and done nothing wrong, and we're making her get on an overnight coach to from Leeds to London and back just to get eight hours sleep, um, uh, what kind of pass have we reached? Mm. Absolutely. I, I, absolutely. I, I, I totally agree with you, Tom. Um, we're coming towards uh, the end of the podcast. Thanks again for uh, taking the time to speak to me. Um, but I do have one final question for you. If you wanted anyone who reads this book to take one thing away um, from reading it, what one thing would you most like everybody who... Um, has read this book and will read this book to take away from from the book. It, it's <laughs> it's always it's always hard because there's a few you know there's the, the point I just made about Mary. There's specific holes in the benefit system that have been cut in terms of you know larger families. And like, but I think the overarching message is that over a very long time we've allowed the basic rates of these benefits to just get too low. So, you know, the carer's allowance that Mike gets in High Wycombe, uh, £69 a week. I mean, he's bound to be on the edge or over the edge when he's being asked to live on £69 um, a week. Um, unemployment benefits, for example, for single adults have been frozen in real terms at best since the 1970s where wages have gone up and up. So they've been tanking as a as a percentage of uh, uh, of earnings for, for, for decades. And then in the last 10 years, I think it's true to say that in eight years, we've suspended the ordinary uprating regime so that benefits have gone up by less than price inflation, um, which means that they've been going down. You know, inflation, like one of the really infuriating things about it is it obscures what's going on. In eight out of the ten last years, we've asked people whose benefits we'd actually frozen, the real value is benefits we'd already frozen for, you know, kind of uh, 30 plus years. We've asked them to get poorer and poorer in eight of the ten last years. And I think really, um, until we've got a decent uh, uh, sort of basic rate of benefit, basic rate of income support, that means that when you have a change of circumstances, you lose a job or... You know, you, 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 you're booted out of one house, so you have to go somewhere else. Uh, that you um, uh, That isn't a trapdoor into poverty or even destitution. Um, then everyone's going to be so scared and in such a panic all the time. It's, it's not reasonable to ask them to take 
charge their lives and to change other things. So that would be the message, is that the basic rate of safety net is too low. It's got low gradually. I understand public money is tight, but I think we can ratchet it back up gradually as well if we decide that's what we want to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you once again uh, for coming on the podcast, Tom. If people want to find out more about you, more about the work of the Joseph Roundtree Foundation and where they can get um, the book, where should they go to, to find these things? Um, well, you can uh, obviously just Google Joseph Roundtree Foundation to um, see its work, which is ongoing on its website. Um, the book is available. It's out with Bite Back. Um, all royalties, I should say, go to uh, Leeds Asylum Support Network. So um, I, I feel um, conscience free in saying if you want to buy it, you, know, you can buy it in Amazon, you can buy it in Waterstones, you can buy it directly from the publisher Bite Back. Um, it is a hardback, but it's as cheap as hardbacks get at fourteen ninety nine. So, um, if you're interested in this stuff, please do give it a read. Fantastic! Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam, and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one. Bye.